Well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, we're just starting out one last issue with Zoom, but I'm going to start off with this session. Um, welcome to the town hall um, that's called Protect People and Elections, Not Big Tech. Um, as an initial disclaimer, this town hall is being organized by Digital Action. Um, we are the conveners of the Global Coalition on Tech Justice. And this is a brand new movement um, that's discussing big tech accountability, how to safeguard elections, and trying to bring in a new conversation or improve the current ones about why should we care um, about elections and why should we make this conversation even closer to social media companies, right? Um, um, the Global Coalition for Tech Justice is a movement with over a hundred organizations and individuals from all over the world. Some of them are with me, actually all of them, a few of them are with me at this panel. Um, but we do have um, more and more organizations and academics joining um, this space to discuss um, some of the things that we um, are planning for today. And as um, for those of you that don't know Digital Action, um, we were founded in 2019 um, with the mission to protect democracy from digital threats. So um, this is gonna be a, a one of those heavy conversations, right, about how social media affects um, democracies and how the other way around works as well. Um, but our work has been um, evolving some work, some like catalyzation of collective action, building bridges, and also ensuring those directly impacted by tech harms are those um, that are actually in power, are those the ones that we are listening to. The Global Coalition for Tech Justice and the Year of Democracy campaign has this general goal of bringing in the perspectives of the victims or of the places in which social media companies um, invest less or much less in, in, in the day-to-day -day lives. Um, so that's a little bit um, of what we want to do. I want to first bring in Alexandra Pardal. She's um, the Global Campaign's director at Digital Action, and then she's gonna open this panel for us and explain a little bit more about um, the Year of Democracy campaign and what we're all about. Alex, um, I think you're in the room, right? Yes, I am. Thank you, Bruna. Uh, and wonderful to, to be with you uh, here. So welcome to all our um, panelists and participants in Kyoto to get today and uh, those joining us from, from elsewhere remotely. Um, this is a global conversation on how to protect people and elections, not big tech. So I'm Alexandra Pardal from Digital Action, a globally connected movement building organization with a mission to protect democracy and rights from digital threats. In 2024, the year of democracy, more than 2 billion people will be entitled to vote as US presidential and European parliamentary elections converge with national polls in India, Indonesia, South Africa, Rwanda, Egypt, Mexico, and some 50 other countries. The largest mega cycle of elections we've seen in our lifetimes. But our information spaces and the ability to maintain the integrity of information and uphold the truth and a shared understanding of reality are more vulnerable than ever. From foreign and malign in influence in elections to the use of new tech like generative AI, making it easier for domestic or foreign actors to manipulate and lie, to financially motivated globally active disinfo industries, the threats have never been bigger nor more pervasive. Elections are flashpoints for online harms and their offline consequences. Now, over the past four years, Digital Action has collaborated with hundreds of organizations in every continent, supporting the monitoring of digital threats to elections in the EU and elsewhere, and led large civil society coalitions demanding a strong Digital Services Act in the EU and better policy against hate and extremism from social media companies globally. This experience has taught us that there's startling inequity between world regions when it comes to protections from harms, uh, from disinformation, uh, hate and incitement to manipulation of democratic processes. Uh, online platforms just aren't safe for most people. 
We know that the platforms run by the world's social media, media giants, Meta, Google, X, and TikTok, have the greatest global reach they've ever had and are at their most powerful. But safeguarding efforts have been weak to protect information integrity globally. For instance, Facebook says it's invested $13 billion in its platform safety and security since 2016, but internal documents show that in 2020, the company plowed 87% of its global budget for time spent on classifying false or misleading information into the U US, even though 90% of its users live elsewhere. This means there's a dearth of moderators with cultural and linguistic expertise where Facebook has been unable to effectively tackle disinformation at all times and most consequentially during elections where when disinformation uh, and other online harms peak. Similarly, non-English languages have been a stumbling block for automated content moderation on YouTube, Facebook or TikTok. Algorithms struggle to detect harmful posts in a number of languages in countries at risk of real world violence and in democratic decline or autocracy. What this means is that the, the risks on the horizon in 2024 are very serious indeed, at a time when social media companies are cutting costs, laying off staff and pulling back from their responsibilities to stem the flow of disinformation and protect the information space from bad actors. If some of the world's largest and most stable democracies, the United States, Brazil, have been rocked by bad actors mobilizing on social media platforms, spreading election disinfo and organizing violent assaults on the heart of their democracies, imagine next year where we'll see democracies under threat like India, Indonesia, Tunisia, alongside a whole swathe of countries that are unfree or at risk, where citizens hope to hold on to spaces to resist the manipulation of the truth for autocratic purposes. How can online platforms be made safe to uphold information and electoral integrity and protect people's rights? So the challenge of 2024's elections mega cycle is a calling to all of us to show up, ideate and innovate, bring our skills, talents and any power we have to the table and collaborate. As an example of what's in the works and background to the perspectives we're going to hear today, together with over 160 organizations now, experts and practitioners from across the world, we've convened the Global Coalition for Tech Justice to launch the 2024 Year of Democracy campaign in order to foster collective action, collaborations and coordination across election countries next year. Together with our members, the Global Coalition for Tech Justice will campaign, research, investigate, and tell the stories of tech harm in global media, supporting and amplifying the efforts of those on the front lines and building policy solutions to address the global impacts of uh, social media companies. So we're going to be actively collaborating with stakeholders and this conversation today is, um, is an opportunity uh, to, to further these conversations and get collaborations off the ground with all those who um, share goals of safe online platforms for all. So I'm delighted to um, introduce this session uh, for this important global com conversation on how we protect 2024's mega cycle of elections from tech harms and ensure social media companies fulfill their responsibilities to make their products and platforms safe for all. So I'm really happy to hand back to Bruna to introduce our panelists and the discussion this morning. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alex, um, and welcome to the session as well. And as um, she just brought up, um, this is really a global conversation, right, that we want to do. We want to spark a discussion on how can we collectively ensure that big tech plays its part in protecting democracy and human rights in 2024 elections. It's not just one, it's 60 elections, as everybody has been talking about this week. So um, it's a rather key year for everyone. 
So um, we have two um, provocative questions, uh, kickoff questions for the panelists. Um, and I'm going to bring you, Ashna, into the conversation first. Um, Ashna is programs coordinator, right, for CIPESA. And um, the first question for you would be um, whether, s in like, if you consider that social media platforms and content moderation, or the lack of it, are shaping democratic elections, and if so, how? Thank you, Bruna. Uh, good evening, everyone, or good morning, like Alex said. I guess we're all in very different time zones at the moment. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for the invitation, Digital Action, and uh, the opportunity to have this very important discussion. Uh, once again, my name is Ashna Kalimera, and I work with CIPESA. CIPESA is the Collaboration on International ICT Policy for East and Southern Africa. We are based out of Kampala, Uganda, but work across um, Africa, promoting effective but inclusive technology policy, but also in its implementation as it intersects with governance, good governance, obviously, uh, human rights, uh, upholding human rights, uh, as well as uh, improved livelihoods. So um, I like to start off these conversations on very light notes. Uh, very often these panels are, are dense in terms of spelling doom and gloom. Um, so first, uh, I'd like to emphasize that technology broadly, uh, including social media platforms and the internet, uh, have huge potential for electro processes and systems. Uh, they are critical in ensuring that voter registration is complete and accurate, uh, enabling remote voting for excluded communities or remotely based uh, voters. Uh, they have been critical in supporting campaigns and canvassing, uh, as well as voter awareness and education. Uh, results transmission and tallying, <coughs> monitoring malpractice, all of them critical to electoral processes and uh, lending themselves to promoting legitimacy and inclusion uh, of elections in states that have democratic deficits, which for most of Africa is many of the states. So uh, I think that light note is very important to highlight uh, as we then go on to the doom and gloom that, we'll <laughs> that this conversation will likely take. Um, and now we start the doom and gloom. Uh, unfortunately, despite those opportunities, there are immense threats uh, that technology uh, poses for electoral processes in, in Africa, and I guess for much of the world. Um, increasingly, we're seeing states, the authoritarian governments especially, uh, leveraging the power of technology for self-serving interests. A uh, critical example there is network disruptions or shutdowns. I see Kipiton coalition members in the room, uh, and they work to push back on that excess. Uh, on disinformation and hate speech, uh, users, governments, the platforms themselves, as well as private companies, PR firms, um, are actively influencing narratives uh, during elections, undermining all the good stuff that I mentioned in the beginning. Uh, and very often we ask ourselves at CIPESA, and I imagine everybody in the room, why disinformation thrives, right? Because <laughs> pretty much everybody is aware of, of the challenge that it poses, but uh, in Africa especially it's thriving, and thriving to very worrying levels. Uh, one of them is again something positive. It's because technology is penetrating and penetrating very well on the continent. Uh, previously unconnected communities now have access to information at a click of a button, literally, which again, in the context of elections is great, but uh, in the case of disinformation, it's, it's a significant challenge. Secondly, is the youth population on the continent, with many of them coming online via social media. Uh, there's always jokes uh, in sessions that uh, I, I, I'm, I'm, I've attended where there's African representation that for many Africans, the internet is social media. And that uh, challenge is uh, enabling so, uh, disinfo and hate speech to thrive. Third is conflicts. Uh, the elections that we're talking about are happening in very challenging contexts uh, eth uh, that are characterized by ethnic, religious, and geopolitical conflicts. Again, all the, the, the nice stuff I mentioned earlier on is then cast with a really dark shadow. Like Alex mentioned, that context that I've just described is going to be a very significant stress test uh, come 2024 and beyond uh, for the continent. And we're likely to see uh, responses that undermine the potential of the technology to uphold electoral legitimacy, but also for citizens to realize their human rights. 
uh, one of those reactions we're likely to see from a state perspective is weaponization of laws uh, to undermine uh, voice or critical opinion online, which again uh, undermines uh, electoral processes and integrity. Uh, and unfortunately, given the context around conflicts, uh, we are likely to see uh, a lot of politically, sorry, uh, el fueling politically motivated violence, uh, which restricts access to credible information and ultimately perpetuates divides and hate speech and can lead to offline harms. Now, bringing the conversation back to big tech, uh, on the continent, unfortunately, we're seeing very limited collaboration uh, between tech actors and media and civil society uh, in, for instance, identifying, debunking, or pre-bunking, uh, depending on which, <laughs> which, <laughs> which fence side of the fence you sit, uh, and moderating disinformation. Uh, also, the processing and response times to reports and complaints are really slow, and this is discouraging reporting and ultimately uh, maximizing, in some cases, uh, circulation of disinformation and hate speech. Um, there are also significant challenges around the opaqueness in moderation measures. Uh, we've seen the case in Uganda during the previous elections where a huge number of, um, what's the word around the automated accounts, uh, were taken down uh, for otherwise not very clear reasons, and that uh, led to a, a response from the state, i.e. shutting down access to Facebook, which remains uh, inaccessible to date in Uganda. So. Uh, Given those pros and cons, and either side of the coins I've just described for the African continent, uh, it's important uh, to have collaborative actions and movements, just like what uh, Digital Action is spearheading and we're really honored to be a part of. Uh, and efforts in that regard should uh, focus on showing up and participating in consultation processes, just like this or others, where the opportunities to uh, challenge or provide feedback and comments, I think that's really important. Such spaces are not many. Um, we at CIPESA host the annual forum on internet freedom in Africa. We marked 10 years a couple of days ago. And uh, for the second time, we were able to have the Meta Oversight Board uh, present and able to engage. They admitted that uh, cases from the African continent are limited, but spaces like the forum on internet freedom in Africa that CIPESA hosts is providing that opportunity for users and other stakeholders uh, to deliberate on these issues. Uh, I cannot not say that research and documentation remains important. Of course, we're a research think tank and we're always churning out a lot of uh, pages and pages that are not necessarily always read, but I think it's important because evidence-driven advocacy is, is critical to this cause. Uh, skills building, again, digital literacy, fact-checking, and information verification, that, that remains uh, critical but also leveraging norm-setting norm mechanisms and raising the visibility of big tech challenges uh, in new end processes, the Universal Periodic Review, the Africa Commission of Human and People's Rights. These conversations are not filtering up as much as they should do, so they should be uh, interventions that are focused on that, and interventions that, of course, promote and challenge uh, private sector to uphold uh, responsibilities and ethics through application of the UN guiding principles on business and human rights. Lastly, uh, is strategic litigation. I think that's also an opportunity uh, that's before us in terms of challenging the excesses that big tech uh, poses for elections in the challenging context that I've just described. Thank you. Thanks, Ashna. Thank you very much. Just speaking on two of the, the topics you spoke about, which is, um, the weaponization of policy-making processes and politically motivated violence. I think that bridges very well with the recent scenario in Brazil, right? Um, with, unfortunately, the repetition or uh, yet another attack on the capital. And um, after the, a, load, like, a lot of discussions on a fake news draft bill and, and regulation for social media um, companies. Yasmin, I'm going to bring you in um, now. Yasmin um, is from FGV Rio de Janeiro and also the co-coordinator of the DC on platform responsibility. Welcome. Thank you so much, Bruna. Uh, could you please display the slides? Thank you so much. So uh, addressing the first question that Bruna posed to us here, uh, are social media and platforms content moderation shaping democra democratic elections? I'm sorry. 
uh, to answer this, que this question, I'd just like to give a brief context about the br elections in Brazil, the, sorry, about the Brazilian legislative scenario regarding platform responsibilities. There are two main pieces of legislation that deal with content moderation issues. Specifically, uh, since 2014, we have the Brazilian civil rights uh, framework, called aka Marco Civil da Internet, probably known by many of you here. Uh, it establishes our basic principles for internet governance, such as free speech, net neutrality, uh, protection of privacy and personal data, but also establishes liability regimes for platforms regarding UGC in its article 19 to 21. To sum up really quickly, uh, article 19 created a general regime in which platforms are only liable for illegal, con uh, illegal UGC content if they not comply with a judicial order asking for the removal of a specific content if it is uh, within the platform's capabilities to do so. There are only two exceptions to this rule, one for copyrights and one for non-authorized intimate imagery dissemination, for which a mere notification of the user or their legal representative is a uh, surface. The second one is the Code of Consumers Defense, aka CDC, which considers users as hypersufficient and vulnerable in their relations with enterprises. In its Article 14, CDC establishes an objective li liability regime, a restrictive, uh, strict liability regime, in which enterprises or service providers are responsible regardless of the existence of fault for repairing damages causes to consumers to due to the facts or insufficient or inadequate information about their risks. So, in this sense, these two pieces of legislation can give users many protections online regarding harmful activities and illegal content. Nevertheless, users are still unprotected of the many online harms that are not clearly illegal, such as disinformation, or that are not even perceived as uh, harm to them, like algorithmic gatekeeping, shadow banning, micro-targeting of uh, problematic content. Regarding the first issue, given the non-existence of a legislation that deals specifically with coordinated disinformation, our electoral superior court has been enacting resolutions to set standards for political campaigns and else. Sorry. <laughs> and else. Uh, so, also, the, the Electoral Superior Court established in the scope uh, of its fighting disinformation program uh, partnerships with the main platforms in Brazil, such as Meta, Twitter, TikTok, Kwai, WhatsApp and Google, that sign official agreements uh, stating what their initiatives would be. In these documents, most of them committed with creating reporting channels, labeling content as electoral related, and redirecting users to the electoral court official website and promoting official sources. Instagram and Facebook also developed cute, cute stickers to support users to vote, in spite of voting being already mandatory in Brazil. Uh, nevertheless, we don't have enough data to see the real impacts of these measures. Just the generic data on how much content was removed in a given platform. Also, generic data on how they are complying with the legislation. This sort of data is offered to by the main platforms in Brazil since the establishment of partnership programs with fact-checking agencies in 2018. I'm not saying that they are not removing enough content. What I want to highlight here is that we don't have data or metrics to understand what these generic numbers means, nor do we have uh, knowledge on the content, if the content is being removed fast enough to not reach enough users. Furthermore, in fact, some of these efforts to combat falsehood on YouTube, for example, were themselves a risk for democracy and elections in 2022. By the official sources program, this is the li slide that is displayed right now, a hyper-partisan news media channel, Jovem Pan, was being active recommended to YouTube users. To give an example, the election day, uh, Jovem Pan was disseminating a fake audio, allegedly from a famous Brazilian drug dealer, Marcos Camacho, aka Marcola, in which uh, he was supporting Lula's election. 
Justice Alexandre de Moraes from the Brazilian Federal Supreme Court, which was presiding in the Superior Electoral Court, ordered for the removal of the content, but not before it had already reached 1.70 million visualizations. Supporters also shared this video at least 30 in 30, 38 WhatsApp groups uh, and Telegram groups monitored by the fact-checking agency Auschwitz. So to Bruna's question, are social media and platforms content moderation shaping democratic elections? I tend to answer no, or at least not significantly, as either we have not significant <coughs> I'm sorry, data, or we do not have enough information on their actions and results. That's it, thank you. Thanks a lot, Jackie. I'm gonna bring it to Leah right now as well. Leah is representing Ipanitech, right? Um, and also a, a fellow Latin American, um, yet another region of the world that's facing a lot of those um, discussions, right? In terms of proper um, resources, deployments, and also um, policy making as well. So Leah, welcome to the panel. <coughs> Okay, perfect. Uh, well, uh, because Ipandetec is a digital rights organization based in Panama City, but working in all Central America. So I'm going to refer mainly to the recent electoral process in Guatemala and the next electoral process in Panama that will take place in May 2024. And the first thing is that I want to send all my support to the Guatemalan people where they are mobilizing in the streets because they are demanding democracy in their past elections in the country. In Central America, digital platforms make tools available to our electoral public entities because they they try to help them to verify the information and to avoid any violation of our digital rights, our fundamental rights as protests, freedom of expression, freedom of press, privacy. But con currently in countries such as Panama, my country, a digital media platform and a journalist were ordered to remove information from their platform by the Tribunal Electoral, is the Panamanian Electoral Public Entity. And, and they got a fine because they were posting information about Ricardo Martinelli Berrocal. I don't know if you know about Ricardo Martinelli. He's very famous. He's so famous as Lula and Bolsonaro in Brazil. Well, he was a former president of Panama and he's a candidate for the next elections in Panama because he wants to be president again. And by the way, he is the most violator of the privacy in the country. So the electoral uh, entity in Panama ordered these journalists to remove information about them because it's against the democracy and it's against their, uh, against their privacy, their uh, own image. So the question is, if big techs are given tools to our public enti electoral public entities to promote democracy, to promote access to information, to promote fundamental rights, why electoral entities put barriers to the citizens, to journalists, and to communicators who their main fulfill is legit legitimate the duty to inform, the duty to communicate to the citizen what is happening in the countries, and more in these cases of corruption, because this former president is very corrupt. So freedom of expression, freedom of information, and freedom press are limiting in Panama when journalists try to communicate based on the principle of public interest that we have in knowing the good the bad of the ugly of our candidates in our electoral process. Digital platform must match their words because with their actions, 
because even though they don't have any autonomy in the country, in the decision of the, uh, the electoral branch, they should not become like part of the problem and limitate constitutional guarant guarantees such as freedom, freedom of <coughs> press. So mainly this is a very recent case that we are uh, follow in Panama and thank you so much Bruna for the space in this panel. Thanks so much Leah, um, very interesting that this kind of like, right, there's an ongoing line of major interferences with um, expression, with conversations online and it's not just like one or, or two countries, when it, but it's often the lack of, um, either sometimes it's the responsiveness, sometimes it's the ongoing conversation or the cooperation that um, social media platforms should have with authorities that, and that should be interesting to be developing that. But there are also downsides to those um, partnerships w when it like goes towards the, the path of like further requests for data and access um, that or even like privacy violations, right? So it is a it definitely a hard and deep conversation. Um, I'm gonna go now to Dan, Daniel Arnaldo from NDI. Um, Dan, so welcome to the panel as well. And same question as the others. Yes, thank you. Thanks for having me. Uh, thanks for everyone for being here. And we're uh, really pleased to be a part of this, uh, this coalition. Um, for those who don't know, uh, I'm from the National Democratic Institute. Um, we're a nonprofit, uh, nonpartisan, non-governmental organization that works in partnership with, uh, with groups around the world to strengthen and safeguard democratic institutions, processes, and values to secure a better quality of life for all. Um, we work globally to observe elections, strengthen elections processes, and uh, my work particularly is to support a more democratic information space. Um, and in this work, we engage with platforms around the world, both through coalitions like this or others, such as the Global Network Initiative, the Design for Democracy Coalition. Uh, we help highlight issues for platforms. We uh, perform social media monitoring. We engage in consultations on various issues, ranging from online violence against women in politics to data access and crisis coordination. Um, I think as was mentioned, 2024 will be a massive year for democracy. And from our perspective, I think we're particularly concerned um, about contexts uh, we work in throughout the global majority and, and particularly small and medium-sized countries that do not receive the same attention in terms of content moderation, uh, policies, research tools and data access, and many other issues. Um, this is all in the context of, I think, what is a serious disinvestment in civic integrity, trust and safety, and, and related teams within these organizations. Um, so just in the region, I think you have Bangladesh, uh, Indonesia, India, Pakistan, and Taiwan that will all hold elections in the coming year. Um, I know there will be some resources devoted to larger countries, but um, on the other hand, they are massive user bases. and. Uh, the smaller ones are gonna receive very little attention at all. So I think this is a consistent focus for um, our work and, and for considerations around these issues. Um, I think one of the, the main kind of recommendations that, that I would have would focus around data access. Um, and, and in the context of this disinvestment, I think we're seeing a, a serious pullback from uh, access for third party researchers. Uh, we are very concerned about changes in the APIs and in uh, different forms of access to uh, data on the platforms, as I think uh, some of my other panelists have discussed for, for research and other purposes, particularly Meta and, and Twitter or X, um, and, and continued restrictions in other places. Um, they are building mechanisms for access to traditional academics in certain cases, uh, but not for researchers or broader civil society that live and work in these contexts. They're often provisioned through uh, mechanisms that are controlled within uh, large countries in the United, like the United States or in Europe. Um, and there aren't really systems in place both um, for documentation or uh, understanding those systems um, and that there are you know, huge barriers to that kind of access even when it's enabled in that sense. Um, so that's something that I would really uh, urge companies uh, in, in the private sector and, and, and groups such as ours to coordinate around in terms of figuring out ways of ensuring that access in future to shine a light within those contexts. Uh, secondly, I think they're ignoring major threats to those who make up uh, half or more of their user base, uh, namely women 
and particularly those involved in politics, either as candidates, policymakers, or ordinary voters. Uh, research has shown that they face many more threats online, and, and platforms need to institute mechanisms that can uh, support them both to protect themselves, to understand threats, to report and escalate issues as necessary. Um, we have conducted research that shows both the scale of the problem, um, but also look to introduce a series of interventions and suggestions for the companies and others that are working to respond to these issues. Um, but I think this is really a global problem that we see in every context we work in globally, and I think uh, many in the room will understand uh, th this threat and this issue. Finally, I think there's a need to consider critical democratic moments and to work within those uh, specific situations, um, how they can work with the broader community to manage them, uh, not only elections, but major votes or referenda, uh, and also uh, more critical moments, uh, such as uh, coups, uh, authoritarian contexts, protests, uh, really critical situations. If they cannot appropriately resource these contexts and situations that they may not have greater understanding of, they at least need to engage with organizations that understand them and help to uh, react and, and effectively uh, make decisions in these challenging situations. I think retreat from programs such as the Trusted Partners in the case of Meta um, and a consistent whittling down of their teams that are addressing these issues will have impacts uh, on these places, on elections, on democratic institutions, and, and ultimately these companies' bottom lines. Uh, the private sector should understand these are not only moral and political issues, but economic ones that will push people away from these spaces as they become hostile or toxic to them in different ways. Uh, we understand the trade-offs uh, in terms of uh, profit and, and uh, you know, organizing systems that are, that are useful for the general public, but we would encourage companies to reflect that the democratic world is integral to the open and vibrant f functioning of these platforms. Um, as with 2016 and 2020, uh, 2024 will be a major election year and, and also likely rec represent a concomitant paradigm shift in, in its moderation and in information manipulation campaigns, in regulation, uh, which is another kind of threat I think that, that companies need to consider, and a host of related themes that will have big implications for their profits as well as democracy. So I think they're gonna ignore these realities at their peril. Thanks a lot, Dan. Um, and also thanks for highlighting some of the things that, right, that are um, the year of democracy campaign. We issued a document that's the campaign ask. So some things we require, require would like to require from social media companies such as streamlining human rights or even um, bringing in more mechanisms to protect users and addressing the problem at the real scale, right? So we are not just saying like, issue um, plans for elections. We're also saying like deploy th the solutions, um, invest the money. It's not just Brazil that matters, but it's also Brazil, India, Kenya, Tanzania. So that's, that's, that's what's really um, core and relevant about this conversation for sure. So thanks a lot, everybody. I would like to ask if anyone would has any questions for the panelists um, or would like to add any thoughts to the conversation. There is a microphone in the middle of the room, so yes. Thank you for giving me some space and uh, ability to express myself. So I'm um, from Russia. We have like a digital election system in Russia. And we were talking about like threats which are posed by global media platforms all around the world, preferably it's Meta, it's like Facebook, Instagram, and uh, Google, and et etc. But uh, we didn't talk about cyber threats to these digital, pla uh, so di these digital election systems. For example, like uh, two months ago, we had an uh, elections all over the Russia and our digital election system was attacked by a denial of service attack by Ukrainian party uh, to disrupt elections and elections were disrupted for like three or four hours uh, and citizens were not able to actually vote. So this is not something about like harming Russia as a state. It is something about harming Russian citizens as citizens. That's no number one problem. Second problem is, I think you have mentioned it before, but I think it's a little bit deeper because we have talked a lot about uh, global media platform involvement in information manipulation, fakes and disinformation spread, et cetera. But we didn't talk about global media platforms position 
which is tend to be neutral, but is not always neutral in terms of conflict, because there are two sides, and sometimes global media platforms choose sides. And uh, what we see and what we talk about a lot is that global media platforms have some very, like, closed, very secret recommendation algorithms, which basically forms the news feed for users. And the situation is that, for example, in some countries in Africa, Facebook, and I think you can approve me, Facebook actually is represent like internet for some people, and Facebook can do a revolution in a click, just altering users' news feed with their like algorithms, recommendation algorithms. And nobody knows how these algorithms work, and I think internet society and global international society and IGF included, should put more pressure on global media platforms for making these algorithms more transparent because people should know why they are seeing this or this content. That's all. Thank you for much uh, for giving me some time. Thanks a lot. Um, any other questions? Uh, hello. Thank you for the panel. My name is Laura. I'm from Brazil. I'm, a, I'm here with the youth delegation, but I'm also a researcher at the School of Communication and Media and Information at Getulio Vargas Foundation in Brazil as well. And uh, I'd like to hear more about uh, the issue of uh, of that data access for academic research and social uh, civil society research as well uh, as a center specializing in monitoring uh, the public debate in social media we are very concerned with the recent changes mentioned by Arnaldo and mentioned by Yasmin as well uh, regarding the the data access for 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 us and uh, I'd like to hear more about what kind of tools and mechanisms can the academic community and the civil society community community in general access to to fight uh, those restrictions uh, and to to face these these issues not only in the regulatory sp sphere uh, where this this debate is present but also in a, in a more broad broad way thank you thanks so much Laura. and the last question mm, yeah okay uh, two points um, uh, I'm Alexander from a country uh, in which, uh, neg in spring of which next year 150 f uh, 145 millions will elect Vladimir Putin as uh, president. Uh, and I have two points. Uh, first of all, I would like to say uh, thank Timofey uh, about uh, information on the DOS attacks because Russian uh, Central Election Commission did, did not confirm any issues with um, electoral si uh, electronic electoral systems. Unfortunately, such system is Russia, uh, in Russia was created by Russian big tech uh, Kaspersky, created one uh, system used in Moscow and Rostelecom, which could be considered um, as a big tech, created another one. Uh, systems completely intransparent, uh, does not comply to uh, Venetian Commission recommendations and other kind of recommendations for uh, digital system. And on my point of view, uh, intended for just faking results. I hope. Uh, um, so if you uh, uh, if you are interested about such details, please ask me later. Uh, but I would like to ask, maybe not panel, uh, but everyone, have uh, have somebody participated in elections last times? Yeah. Okay. Tr uh, have you tried to use uh, platforms for your promotion? Uh, okay. Nowadays. Uh, um, uh, I also would like to inform Timothy Facebook is not possible, is not legal to, to be used uh, in promotions. But before, I've created a political activist or political candidate page on Facebook uh, and would like to advertise myself in constituency with about uh, 20,000 voters. Uh, so I asked Facebook, please make a suggestion, and they suggested me two new contacts for 10 bucks. Uh, so uh, I think uh, in some cases, uh, either platforms don't understand requirements for candidates, if, if it's not presidents, something like, uh, either we need to work with this, uh, either they will, will want too much money for promotions, because okay, if, if I would create uh, pret a -pret cakes, maybe two contacts for 10 bucks is reasonable, but not for uh, the one uh, who wants to advertise uh, himself uh, in a constituency. Uh, so I think uh, such work uh, with platforms uh, and platforms helping candidates, especially in restrictive regimes where, where advertisements on the physical media is no longer possible, 
uh, is also should be done. Thank you very much. Thanks, Alexander. Um, we have one extra question from the chat that I'm just going to hand out to you guys. And you don't need to answer all of them, the ones that speak to you the most, I guess. Um, the one that's on the chat is, um, what should be done legally when some cross-border border digital platforms like Meta refuse to cooperate to national competent authorities regarding cybercrime cases like incitement to violence and promoting pornography for children, children and private images, and even in serious crimes, and, to refu and refuse to establish official representatives in the country. Rather dense question as well, but um, I will give it back the floor to you guys. And, and as we move into to the very end of the session, you only have um, 12 more minutes. I would maybe also ask you to, in a tweet, um, if you could summarize, um, what would be your main recommendation for addressing this so-called um, global equity crisis and big tech accountability? So I don't know. I know it's it's difficult to summarize that, but if you have a tip, an idea, um, a pitch for that, it's very much welcome. Um, I'll start with you, Ashna. Thank you, Bruna, uh, and thank you for the very, very rich questions. Um, I think they highlight that this conversation is not uh, limited to elections and misinfo and dis, uh, disinfo or hate speech, but there are very many other aspects around it. Uh, the DOS attacks that you pointed out, which speak to uh, tech and uh, the resilience of not just civil society organizations, but even electoral bodies uh, and commissions or entities that are state owned or run and uh, leverage technology as part of elections. Um, as well as other conversations around um, accessibility and exclusion, because some of that technology around elections uh, uh, excludes key communities, which brings about apathy uh, and low voter turnout, all of them uh, critical to the conversation around elections. Similarly, the point around positions and, and the power of these uh, tech companies uh, to literally start revolutions, uh, to borrow your word, uh, I think that too is an area that uh, is, is critical to uh, deliberate more on. The answers are not very immediate. Um, some of the work that we've done uh, in researching how disinfo um, uh, manifests in, in varying contexts has highlighted that the agents, the pathways and the effects vary from one context to another. Uh, like I mentioned in the beginning, uh, in contexts where there's conflicts, religious, or border conflict or electoral, um, electoral conflict, the manifestations are always very different. The agents are always very different. So we're not necessarily pointing a finger only at big tech, but um, I think we are all mindful of the fact that this is a multi-stakeholder uh, conversation that must be had uh, and should be cognizant of all those challenges. There was an issue on research. I think that's something that we've felt uh, on the continent, the inaccessibility of data. Uh, previously at CIPESA, we've um, leveraged uh, data APIs, I believe that's the technical term, uh, to document elections and, and, and monitor elections, social media sentiment analysis and micro-targeting that capacity is now significantly limited, so we're not able to highlight uh, some of the challenges uh, that uh, emerge during elections around big tech. That's not to say uh, documentations through stories or humanization would not have the same effect uh, if the access to data is limited. Um, what else did I want to talk about? Now I forget because there were so heavy, heavy questions. But yes, the conversation is much broader than just elections and big tech alone. Uh, we all have a role to play. Uh, and engaging uh, the m least obvious actors like electoral bodies, um, regional, uh, regional economic blocks, and, and other human rights monitoring or human rights norm setting mechanisms is also critical to the conversation. So, uh, regarding <laughs> recommendations, I think it's only possible actually to have really real accountability I if we have like specific legislation and regulation of platforms. It's not possible to have like a multi stakeholder uh, conversation if we have like the sort, the, the 
power symmetries are just too big for us to sit on the same table and discuss with them and talk to them. They set all the rules that are on the table, on the table, so it's not possible to talk to them without regulation. Uh, in Brazil, for example, uh, during the elections again, the journalists Patricia Campos Melo and Renata Galf asked Facebook how much it they were investing, uh, not only Facebook, sorry, Facebook and YouTube, how much they were investing in content moderation in Brazil to see how much they were uh, complying with their own uh, memo agreements that they made with, that they signed with the Superior Electoral Court. And they did not answer. They just said that this was sensitive data. And this is uh, like we are talking about aggregated data of how much they were investing financially to improve their content moderation in Portuguese. Uh, so if we don't have this basic information, if we don't have like how to assess how much con how much harmful content is being recommended by their platforms, it is quite difficult to uh, be to for us to be able to uh, make pol proper pol public policies to address these issues. So I'd just like to display the slides again, just to do some propaganda. Sorry, sorry. Can you display the slides again, just a minute? Just to make a, prop a brief propaganda, uh, we <laughs> have at the CPR our Dynamic Coalition on Platform Responsibilities. Uh, our outcome uh, last year was a framework on meaningful transparency, meaningful and interoperable transparency, with some thoughts for policymakers and uh, regulators, sorry, worldwide if they want to implement and also platforms if they, wa they are uh, able and eager to improve their best practices. So they also can adopt this framework. And this year, our outcome we are going to release tomorrow, also focusing on human rights uh, risk assessments and else. So this is our title, it's like a uh, a uh, collaborative paper with uh, best cases and also discussing legislation in India, DSA, DMA, the Brazilian legislation. So we are going to release it tomorrow. Our session is at 8.30. So thanks. I'm sorry for doing the propaganda. I just wanted to show the document. So this is what I would recommend for people to... Yeah, uh, thanks for the questions. Um, I think certainly algorithmic transparency can be a good thing. You just have to be careful about how you do it um, and to create systems to understand the algorithms. I think they can also be gamed in different ways if you have a perfect understanding of them. So it's a tricky business. Um, I think uh, definitely on need for better protections and systems for smaller candidates in different contexts. Uh, there's, a, it's a part of the system, right? It's not just the individual users and what they're seeing and how these systems are, or these networks are being manipulated, but also how candidates can have access to information about political advertising or about even basic registration information. I think every country in the world should have access to the same systems that are used uh, by Meta and by other major uh, companies, Google and others, to promote good uh, political information. And I mean very basic political information about voting processes, about uh, political campaigns um, anywhere in the world. Um, I think on data access, certainly, um, you know, you're, you're seeing a revolution right now in terms of how the companies are providing access to their systems. And I think it's focused on on X uh, and Twitter uh, that has changed the way that uh, any sort of uh, research is being done on those platforms. Uh, it's much more expensive. It's more difficult to get at. Uh, I think companies need to reconsider what they're doing in terms of um, revising those systems and making them more difficult for different groups. Um, Meta in particular, I think, will be really critical. So I think we need to work collectively uh, to make sure that they make uh, those kinds of systems like APIs available to as many uh, kinds of people as possible. Um, I think, you know, certainly there, there are issues around um, placing company employees in certain uh, countries around the world, and, and that can be problematic in certain ways because they could also be authoritarian contexts, and then uh, the, the, the employees become... 
uh, uh, bargaining chips uh, potentially within certain kinds of uh, regulations that they want to enforce. So you have to be careful about that. But I certainly understand the need uh, to enforce uh, regulations around privacy and, and content moderations and other issues. Um, so I think it's something that has to be designed carefully. Um, I think, you know, certainly there's there's a huge crisis um, I in terms of how uh, companies are addressing different contexts. And they need, I think, ultimately to better staff and resource uh, these issues or, or these different contexts. So to have people that speak local languages, that understand these contexts, that can respond to issues and reporting, that uh, know what they're doing. but. This is this is expensive, and I don't think uh, you're going to be able to, um, you know, work your way out of it through through AI or something like that, as many have proposed. So, I just think it's something that, that they need to recognize that reality, or they're going to continue to suffer. As unfortunately, we, we will all. Just one minute. <laughs> well, I think that it's necessary not just to empower the electoral authority; it's most necessary to empower citizens, civil society organizations, human rights defenders activists because we are we are really working to promote and to conserve the democracy in our countries so this is the main recommendation and regarding your question about the data in for example in our case we are working in a monitoring uh, digital violence based uh, against human candidates in the next election in Panama and everything is very manual because the digital platforms, they don't make available the tools to the civil society. They make available the tools to the government. So we are trying to sign like an agreement with the electoral authority to maybe have access to that tools because it's necessary to finish the war before the elections. And in another case, the data is not clean. They don't use open data uh, standards. So we have to find and sometimes guess the information that they have uh, mm, not upgrading in, no in, their, in their website. So it's a bit difficult for us to work with the, this kind of data. Thanks a lot to the four of you and Alex as well that is following us um, directly from the UK. Um, thanks everybody for sticking around as well. If any of this conversation um, like stroke a note with you, um, go to the yearofdemocracy.org. That's the website for the Global Coalition for Tech Justice campaign and um, have a nice rest of the IGF. Thanks a lot. <laughs> <laughs>